Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 402 for Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for this epitaph, easy for you to say. Yeah, I'll say, is factormeals.com slash giggab50. That's where you're going to go and use code giggab50 for 50% off of these delicious meals that have actually been super convenient for us while we've been having our kitchen redone for the past, I don't know, 15 years or whatever it feels like. We'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Hey, I like that voice. I missed that voice last week. It's good to have. Ah. Uh, yes, yes. It was it was uh, a out of body experience to be a spectator or a or a listener <laughs> yeah. for a week and hear you do your thing. Yeah, yeah you did yeah. a good job. Thanks, man. Yeah, that was fun. It's fun. Yeah. He he had a lot of good insights uh, on on sort of the whole in ear thing. I I love. We've had several people on the show over the years. You know, from different aspects and angles of that industry and it seems like we talk about the same thing and learn new things from each and every one of them which is fascinating yeah, the, the two parts that were most useful for, again you did a good job it was a fascinating conversation and he's a super interesting guy yeah but the the section on how to get molds and you know using bite blocks and how your ear you know forms in different positions that was really interesting you've been through that right you've gotten yeah. molds done for your ears how like how long has it been, I guess, since you've done it? It's probably been a little while, yeah? Yeah, it's, I think it's probably about seven years, I think. And, and I got him at a local audiologist in San Jose. She seemed to know what the drill was. And, you know, I did not shop around. I don't remember them being terribly expensive at the time that needed me to go. But, you know, 250 Dude, you know. I, I, I didn't ever know to shop around in the past, right? Like anytime I've done this and I've probably had my ears molded. If, if I say 25 times, it's, if it's an exaggeration, it's by two, it's been 23 times, but it's probably, that's probably undershooting it. And there was one audiologist I found in, in Connecticut. It was a clinic near my house at the time. And they were like, Oh, you're going to be doing a bunch of this. We'll, we'll do 15 bucks a set. Now this was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So th things change. But then I had it done here when I worked with Jerry Harvey from JH and like they were, it was maybe, maybe 30 bucks a set, 30, 30 bucks an ear at most. Like it, it was less than a hundred bucks for all in. And then I went last year, I finally convinced my wife to get uh, what they call musicians earplugs, right? We go to a ton mm. of concerts together. I've had a set of musicians. I've actually had two sets over time. Cause the first set I had like stiffened up and, and wasn't great anymore. So I got a new set of them, but they're earplugs with that, that are custom fit and uh, have filters in them. So they block out everything. And then the filters help just bring the volume level down equally across the board. So you can still hear really well. And you know, you get like a 15 dB or 20 dB loss, uh, you know, a reduction depending on how you do it. And I've been trying to convince Lisa for years to get these things. And, you know, she always wears earplugs at shows. And finally she was like, okay, fine. So, uh, and she, the only thing she regrets is that she didn't do it like 10 years ago. But um, I found an audiologist and it was like, okay, well, we'll both go. And I needed molds for something at the time. I forget what it was. And uh, my ears were too dirty. Uh, you know, you got to have, you, 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 your ears need to be clean and not full of wax. So they couldn't do me that the day they did her and we went out to the, um, you know, the lobby to pay and they're like, okay, it's, well, it's 200 bucks. And I was like, well, yeah, but I didn't do mine today. So I, I'm not going to pay for mine today. I'll just pay for mine when I come back. And mm -hmm. they were like, yeah, no, it's, it's a hundred dollars an year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that's as much as I'm paying for the earplugs the in ears yeah yeah what? well on, on the so, one hand anyway it's their time and expertise you know I, it is i sort of get that yeah but it seems like some some audiologists do it almost as a loss leader service um you can get it for free like a nam you can yeah. get it for free in a lot of these places right if, right if you can get into right and and i i don't know if there's other like are there other like pop-up like 
at, at art and wine festivals. I wonder if there's like yeah. audiology, you know. So anyway, I think if you, it, it, the point is, it could be anywhere from a hundred in a year to fifteen in a year, or free. If you look around, if you really you know want to find a way to kind of game the system, I think it can, can is possible to do. You know what I would have wanted to talk about if I was there, which I regret not being. It is still fascinating to me. So you've used these, and you're you're in, very impressed with the quality. Yeah, I would say to to make it clear, I am as impressed. These are up to par with every other in-ear monitor I've tested over the years, and I've probably tested 10 to 15 of them uh, from brands, you know, the Ultimate Ears is the one that I, I talk about the most because that's the one I've been wearing yes. most, most recently, but I've tested Future Sonics and Sensophonics and West Tone and JH Audio and probably another brand or three that I'm forgetting, but, you know, all the major ones, most of the major ones, I, I should say, and these are on par. With, with, you know, they, they are top notch quality, just like the rest of them are. It's just that the pricing is, you know, radically different, which is, yeah. which was the whole point. But yeah, yes. So that's, the, but that's the question is like, you know, we were talking about when you were getting excited to do this interview, that there is some commoditization, like there's enough, there's enough demand from weekend warrior cover bands to do this now that it seems like the market is changing. And, you know, at first there was just, you know, uh, ultimate ears and, um, and, uh, what's, what's the one that Danny used to consult for? Yeah, it was, it was West tone, ultimate ears and future right. Sonics and sense of Yeah. They're, but future Sonics. They were right. kind of it. Yep. And yep. then we had J audio. We had, did we have the 64 audio guy on? No, on the I've show? never tested 64 audio. I I've looked into them. Super expensive. But the price is like, well, why would I? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And is it literally, is it, is it a brand thing, a brand perception thing? I, I would, I would, I would bet most weekend warriors are not going to be that discerning, right? Cause you actually, you said, you said, this is the Holy grail sounds the way that works for you at a price point that works for you. And, but, but actually if these were the same price as, as the uh, ultimate ears, would, would you have a discernible difference between them? Um, no, I, I mean, each model is going to be a little different, right? Yeah. But, but like in terms of objectively, you know, this entire product line is better than that entire product line. No, they're, I mean, I, I think there's two, maybe three companies that make the balanced armatures that are going to go in, in everyone's in-ears. Like there's, there it's go. not like there's 15 or, or 50 right. vendors that you're going to, so no, yeah, no. Yeah. So that's the thing is, is you, you, you wonder, is there a tipping point? Like I said, I, I think the adoption of these, that curve has got to be rapidly going, right? A, just because people don't want to schlep wedges around, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, There's right. Nothing else for, 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 you know, convenience, but B, you know, at cost. And so I wonder if there's somewhere on that curve where demand is enough, where the prices will fall off the will fall off the cliff for these things. I would, I would think so. Cause it, it's it, like, there's also, and this is all Claire's market is in the uh, main market is in churches, right? Like, cause all those yeah. houses of worship that have bands every week, a lot of them are silent stage with in ears and like the whole right. thing. And that's just normal. So yeah, there's, there's a, there is a market for this. It's not like there's a top end to this market, but there's clearly enough of them. When we had Adam Moskowitz on, he mentioned, uh, that I think one of the drummers that he works with uh, in his van band works for clear tune monitors. Now that was one I'd never heard about before. And I went and looked at the, you know, at their website and it's like, okay, their two drivers, three ninety nine, Great. Like that, that's priced where it should be. But you start getting up like their six driver is eleven ninety nine. It's right. like, okay. Like it's, it's less than ultimate ears, but who, what, like, Again, it's kind of the same, all the same stuff. So if you don't have brand recognition that you can use to sell your products, what are you going to use to sell them for more than All Clear? Now, the difference is maybe you've never heard of All Clear. I'd never heard of Clear Tune. I'd never heard of All Clear. I, I had found All Clear, but I, I didn't reach out to them. I didn't know who they were uh, until I talked to Mike Dias about it. So um, I, it's just. And there may be others. There's got to be, of course, there are others, right? That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Let us know. Feedback at uh, giggabpodcast.com because like th this is, I'm glad we have found all clear, but to your point, 
Paul, like there's a commoditization that naturally can happen here. It's got to be happening, right? I would think. Oh. Well, I'm looking forward to trying all Claire. So, yeah. you know, I I, I want to, I mean, I've had my ultimate years for, I think, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love, you know, to try something new and just, you know, see. And, and the price points are fascinating. And, you know, I got 10 guys in my band. Uh, I'm the only one with custom in ears. So, you know, I wonder if at this price point, you know, we can get these guys to understand they can all have it. And it's that's actually the other bit. thing. Yeah. It's like, like Nick, who's pretty picky. Um, he uses, you know, one of those um, Chinese uh, Amazon.com like ones. The KZ or whatever they are. Yeah, yep. exactly. He's happy with it. The people are happy with it for, for universal fits. People seem yeah. to be very happy with the, with the KZs. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. And that's like under a hundred bucks. Yes. So. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's crazy. Anyway, yeah. you did a very good job. Thanks, and man. It was enjoyable for me to listen, and and uh, yeah, you don't need me. <laughs> I like you, though. I missed having <laughs> you, Paul. It's <laughs> it's not so much about need; it's want, my friend. Uh, uh, you plan any Christmas gigs? Well, this is I, no, and actually, I'm I'm surprised, but I would like to offer. I've asked. I don't know anybody who's playing any Christmas gigs. So well, that's not true. I don't know. Well, no, no, I don't know any, any Bay area bands that I, you know, talk to that have any like good corporate Christmas gigs. So I don't know if there are as many corporate events. I don't know if it's a COVID thing. I don't know if it's a DJ thing, uh -huh. but um, unusually I do not know any of the local suspects of people that I hang out with that have shared that they have any, any privates in, in, uh, in December. Interesting. How about you? Yeah, I, I, I do. I got a call, a text the other night from our friend uh, Dave Brunyak. Remember, we had him sure on the show. Uh, Pink Talking Fish. He was he was the guitar player in Pink Talking Fish for a long time. He is he no longer is that they, they've got a, a different guy in that band now. Dave kind of moved on from them, but yes, the, exactly that guy. Great player, great guy. He and I had played together a little bit right before he joined Pink Talking Fish, and we. Stayed in touch, but haven't really been in touch frequently. And the other night I got a, a text from him and he was like, hey, are you available on December 2nd or whatever? whatever. I think that's the date uh, to play a, a Christmas gig with me. And I was like, uh, yeah, maybe like, you know, <laughs> let me look at my calendar. I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. You know, it'd be fine, great to finally play together. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing this country Christmas thing. He is playing under the name Dallas Corbin. And he's been doing this country thing for a little bit. And, uh, and so I was like, yes, yeah, sounds great. And then it turns out there's, he's doing, I think uh, six of these or something. Uh, and I'm playing two of them with him. He, he lives kind of in, so the, uh, the middle of Southern Massachusetts. So uh, he's got, you know, somebody down there that's doing the, the gigs sort of in that area, but he needed somebody for gigs kind of on, on this side of, of new England. And, uh, and, or or maybe his other guy's not available. I have no idea, but uh, but uh, yeah, I'm doing two of them with him, and I, the set list looks great. It's like you know, the Blake Shelton Christmas album essentially, and it's I mean the songs are going to be a blast. It's it's going to be so yeah. Let's talk about Christmas music for a little bit. I mean, I know I got to start listening to it a month early, man. I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like we're a little bit early, but not yeah. necessarily that early because yeah. you know some um, corporate holiday parties are in November, right? Some fair. people try to get ahead of it. Fair, fair. Because there's, you know, there's only X amount of weekends in, um, in, uh, in December. So, so first thing is years ago, when we were little tiny house rockers, we, um, the first thing that we did was we had a guy in the band who owned a theater. Okay. Perfect size, like a 200 seat theater. And they, you know, their main business was doing a melodrama that was kind of residency in there and it's sold out all the time. But, um, he was in the band, piano player, good piano player. Yep. And he goes, yeah, you know, if you want to do a show, just let me know. So we did a Saturday night in December. We did a Christmas show. Back then, when we were little house rockers, um, uh, the first incarnation of the house, well, the early incarnation of the house rockers was really influenced by that, the great, you know, swing scare of the, <laughs> of the, <laughs> yeah. so all that Brian Setzer stuff. So, and yep. Setzer has a great Christmas album. I mean, a great Christmas album. So we took three or four from that. We took a couple Springsteen Christmas songs because he's done a lot of Christmas shows and there are a lot of good bootlegs from those. And we put together, you know, a probably out of, out of a 
three hour show, maybe an hour and a half, hour 15 of Christmas music, and the rest was just our dance music. And um, it sold really well and really easily. And it was really fun. And it was the first time I kind of got an experience for events where people can bring their kids to enjoy music that they like yep. is was was really attractive. So this is this is your stone church experience basically, right? It, yeah, when we were doing those fling fests exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. So um so two things. One that was our first taste for doing uh ticketed shows and that was a lot of fun uh and we learned a lot. And you know, we we have a book now of some decent uh Christmas music. So we did that for maybe 3 4 5 years I think. And then we just kind of put it away for whatever reason. Sure. And um, but now that we have this experience with doing ticketed shows, I bet it would work again. I, I mean, again, it's all about finding the right place with the right deal. But um, I think it would work again. I don't have any issue playing Christmas music. Some people find it a little too kitschy, and you know, for they sure. don't like it. But there's so much great artists. Christmas albums to cover from, to grab from. I mean, Chris Isaac's one is fantastic. Um, uh, Bare Naked Ladies has a Christmas album that has some great stuff oh, yeah. on it. I mean, there's so much out there to find to do cool Christmas music. Willie Nelson has a great one. I mean, most country artists have a good one. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I find it kind of fun. And, you know, you I, I mean, I like playing. Pocket. I like playing music with people that can play. And, yeah. and, and hopefully for crowds that are appreciative of, of it, you know, and, and both of those things I think are, are, you know, high, high likelihood of that happening. I don't know the, uh, for these two Christmas gigs that I'm doing with, I guess Dave calls his project Heartland Radio. And, uh, I, like it's, it's like Dave can play. And so I know that the people he's got with him are going to be able to play. And so it's like, yeah, we'll do one rehearsal and, and then we'll go out and rock these gigs and it'll be a blast. I mean, it, it's it, playing country music. It, it, I mean, these are Christmas songs done in a country style. So it's country music, you know, whatever mm -hmm. is an interesting thing. Before I ever played it, I did not like country music. Um, I'd never gotten an appreciation for it, playing it uh, or listening to it. And I therefore never played it. And then when I lived in Texas, I wound up getting picked up for a friend of mine that was kind of in like a pop punk sort of outfit as I knew him was getting back to his country roots and was like, Hey, you know, will you play this gig with me? I'm like, Oh sure. You know, and he'd put that, like he'd recorded a bunch of country tunes and, and then we played a bunch of covers too. And, um, I learned his record and just the rehearsal process of it was like, Oh, holy crap. Like this is hard to play simply. Cause there's, you know, stops at the right time and the feels gotta mm -hmm. be right. And the tight harmonies and like all, and I, I fell in love with playing it and it, you know, and then I wound up like on the road with hypnotic clam bake where we were playing like bluegrass stuff. And obviously we do a bunch of that in bitter pill too. So like it, it's all right there, but yeah, I'm like, I don't have any problem playing Christmas music and, and I don't have any problem playing country music either. So it's all kind and of the same. It's like, like, like I said, if you're a working musician, you put that in your back pocket and you've got gigs for December, you know, wherever Correct. you go. Correct. Right? Yeah. That's that if you too. Do it well, you'll right. stick out. Yep. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. It's fun stuff. Good cool. stuff. Oh man. So the last couple of months have been rough at home without a kitchen as our kitchen has been under construction and renovations. And there's not much more disruptive to one's life than not having a kitchen but thankfully, Factor, our sponsor and America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, made our lives way easier because Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes in the microwave. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. And this made our lives so much better. These meals are delicious. They got great proteins, great flavor, Good veggies. You get to pick from over 35 weekly flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals that support that healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences. Again, all delivered right to your door and ready to eat in just two minutes. You can skip the stress of meal prepping over the holidays with Factor, right? Like, there's all kinds of craziness going on. I will tell you, there is not much more convenient than being able to look in the fridge and say, hey, which of these factor meals do I want for dinner? Okay, this one looks fantastic. The red pepper chicken. All right, great. Take it out. Put it in the microwave. Two minutes later, boom, we're eating dinner. It's great. Head to factormeals.com slash giggab50 
and use code GIGGAB50 to get 50% off. That's code G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0 at factormeals.com slash GIGGAB50 to get 50% off. And our thanks to Factor Meals for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. Hey, um, back two episodes ago in uh, 400, Paul, we were talking about rebranding your band. Yeah. And we got a note from Gord. Uh, I believe the name of his band is Clubbing Fraggles, I I think. Uh, (laughs) And he says, I just listened to the episode. Great discussion. When my band started, our initial thoughts were, let's just play whatever we want. This led to a varied song list with no consistency whatsoever. There was one year in which we may have played out twice. After that, we graded all of our songs, A, B, C, or D, based on audience familiarity only, and then immediately dropped all the C's and D's and made the B's temporary. We went from having three sets of tunes to enough for about one set in a five-minute period. But he says that meant that only meant we had a lot of work to do. We also adopted a consistent look, shirts, ties, and oversized nerd glasses. Not original, I know, but yep. It turns out we might just dress like waiters. Well, I don't know. The nerd glasses probably give it away. Uh, He says it wasn't long after these changes that things turned around and we went from no gigs to bar gigs and eventually corporate and wedding gigs with uh, an optional horn section. However, he says, Dave, you were right. With 16 years of hindsight now, I really think we would have had more success if we had changed our silly name to something a little more corporate wedding friendly. But hey, what can you do? I, you know, it works. Like I'm, I'm impressed that they made it through the, the, like the, the, the change in focus of the band with the same lineup. It, clearly everybody must've been on the same page after, you know, a year of not gigging and, and the yeah. frustration of that. But like, I, that, that's, I'm so glad you shared this because it's a rare story, man. <laughs> it's, I, I don't, I don't usually hear of bands a, a band's lineup surviving that kind of a change. Well, if you think about everything that we've talked about in, over nine years, I mean, we've talked about business models for bands. We, we we just did an episode about what is the what is the blueprint for a good corporate band just a couple yep. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and you know, there's Adam's model. There's there's the House Rockers model. There's there's the you know Uptown model. I mean, yeah, I, variations on a theme. But yes, yep. I, it, it, the common denominator is probably that there's a a motivated booking guy who has his act together and goes out and makes it happen. That yes, that like <laughs> yes. If that doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what model you follow because you don't actually have a model. It turns out. Yeah. Yep. That I there mean, needs to be that. Yes. Yeah. 100%. So Gord's response, you know, makes a lot of sense. You know. A, an overly silly name might not get you in the door, even if you are a good salesperson, might not get you in the door, you know, with for a corporate discussion, right? So, you, you know, you try and try and put as many things in your favor to, you know, have someone take your call or, you know, that type of thing. So, but I, I think at the end of the day, even that, I, I, I think, what is it? Crawling Fraggle? What is it? Uh. <laughs> Sorry, let me pull it up again. Clubbing Fraggles. Clubbing Fraggles. Yeah. Oh, poor Fraggles. I mean, why did why did they need to be clubbed? Did they do something wrong? Like what are you, what are we no, clubbing? Maybe they're, not, maybe they're maybe they're night clubbing Fraggles. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Is that what they mean when they talk about seals? I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> seals at a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> I now I know what the episode image is. Thank goodness I have ChatGPT's Dolly. Yep, that's it. Yep. Oh, that's it. Clubbing Seals is now a band name for somebody, right? It's got to be. It's it's going to be the be. name of the episode. So, like, y- you wow. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gord. Yeah. Are we going to get canceled when when we just have an episode titled Clubbing Seals and 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 people don't quite understand no. it and, until the 24 minute mark? <laughs> put put a drink in their little hand. Oh no, it's and, I, and, like uh, yeah, yeah, ChatGPT will take care of me on this one. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I think that seems to be the common denominator. I mean, do you remember it? Like in the very beginning, when we started having these conversations, I had said being in a cover band or starting a cover band is an exercise in trying to prove yourself right. You want to find the magic songs 
that you always think, oh, if people just heard my fastball, sure, sure. my sweet home Alabama, right? And I, I, I think we just kind of keep coming back to that, that, that uh, at the end of the day, most people do it wrong. So if you do it a little bit more right than, than other people, you're probably ahead of the game in, in getting your band booked. Don't, don't you agree? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I do agree. I, I, I think you need, yeah, you just got to go out and do it. Somebody needs, your point before is really, if you're going to learn one thing from nine years of gig gab, it's that. And I think most musicians figure it out eventually that you need someone who is out there doing the booking and making it happen. And, you know, if, if you're a, I, it, and I'll I, like, there's all different formulations of bands, but if you are a band where the members are all the same all the time and you're not subbing anything out, be it an original band or a cover band or whatever, you need that person. And if that person's not in the band and they're not close to the band, then the band's not going to gig. Right. It's just that, you know, like how it works. But it, you know, otherwise a, a, a working musician who plays in a bunch of different bands probably identifies that, that trait in someone. And it's like, okay, I need that. I like that person. I want to maintain well, a good relationship with, right. Yeah. You know. Well, maybe. So here, here's the other thing. <laughs> so the other thing would be, um, you know, the other thing that we have talked about for nine years is communication and having a band of guys who are on the same page, or at least are willing to, vocalize that they are in tacit agreement with, you know, what the band is doing. Sure. Style of music, number of players, the way you dress, type of gigs, whatever it is, um, that the band is on the same page. I heard something really funny the other night. I was babysitting my grandson and I had nothing to do. And so I'm flipping through HBO and they have the Howard Stern interview with Springsteen. That was about a year ago, maybe, if, Who? if that, right? Who? You know, you know that, you know, come on. I, oh, I remember. No, I listened to Howard Stern when I was a kid. I know who exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well played. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Anyway, um, and he was talking about how meticulous Springsteen was in the studio. They were talking about the song Jungle Land. Do you know that song? I do, actually. Yeah, All right. I will. Yeah. And it has a very epic um, sax solo that legend is that Springsteen sang it line by line to Clarence Clemens to then play. And they had many, many takes. And that what you end up hearing is an amalgam of a sung lines from Springsteen to Clarence to play over many takes that was then pasted together. And so Howard was kind of, you know, you, you did this for 16 hours and Springsteen said one key to being a good band member, find guys who have, don't have somewhere else to go. <laughs> so that, <laughs> yes, I, I can, I can empathize with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that there is something to be said for that. I could I could say the same thing about uh, kitchen contractors, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kitchen gab. That's a different show. Oh man, oh man! Thank goodness for those factor meals. Yep. Um, yeah, find guys who don't have somewhere else to go. I, I like that. Yeah, yep. that's good. That's that's. I played a gig um, on Saturday on Sunday. Yep. So you know my buddy Mel, who's a you know. He's a little bit more than a beginner drummer now. I mean, he's just been working hard for it. And he has a little local band of people about that. And, you know, when I moved down here, he's one of our best friends. And, you know, him and his wife are mine and my wife's really, really dear friends. And, yeah. and um, so even during the pandemic, when we moved, you know, I would go while he was learning. And he's really diligent about his lessons and about practicing. He, That's good. He, he practices a lot. Yeah. And um, so... We've done, I think, three gigs at his house that are just little backyard barbecues. Yeah. And then the last one went so well that a friend of his said, hey, and, you know, down where, he, where we live here, people have a little bit more land. And so this guy built a stage at his house, a beautiful I love that. home. We get that. Yeah. We get that here, too. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah well, I mean, people have the room. Yes, and, correct. You know, correct. He, he yeah. lives up on a bluff that overlooked the ocean. I mean, it was just spectacular. So we played someone else's house party, um, and it was a lot of fun. So, you know, the the... He's getting, Mel's getting much better. You know, like the ramp of how people improve is an interesting thing, right? It's not linear. It it fits and starts, right? Yep. Oh yeah. And, you just, you just keep hitting plateaus is, is what it yeah. is. And, and it, it, the time between each plateau gets longer and longer and longer. The more you play, that's what yep. I find anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that's actually probably 
true of mastering anything. Right? I, I, that's fair. Yes, it has not. It's not. Ju- it's not unique to music for, by any yeah. stretch. Yeah, that's right. But this little band, you know, they're super nice people, and um, the woman who sings when she first started singing, she has a really nice voice. She was so nervous. I mean, her hands were shaking. You know, get, holding the microphone, and but you know when she would just close her eyes and sing, you could tell she had a nice voice. Well, she's the leader of the band. She's the, she's a front person now. Ah. Uh, they rehearse without me sometimes, which is kind of cool. And and you know they're kind of on their own path. But it was. I remember when I started the House Rockers, I was the least experienced musician, and I was like, "Wouldn't you rather just play?" You know, you know, as opposed to sitting home. You know, and. For people who have their instrument in their hands, you know, 10 hours a day, the answer is no, you know, like, like, unless it's worth it to play. Yeah. Right. And worth it could be whether it's good people or good pay or whatever it is worth. It can mean whatever it means to anybody else. But it's funny because, you know, whenever I, whenever I, I always love playing with these guys because they're so nice and it's fun to watch it get better, but there's some, you know, it's, some nights where it's just hard for me to get done with the day of work and, and go to a rehearsal. Right. But I was reminded doing this gig about when I started, I was, I was that guy. Right. And I was like, isn't this great? You know, we're, we're playing music together and you know, these guys who teach eight hours a day and then, you know, gig at night. And then they're rehearsing with the newly formed house rockers on their off night in a very big, you know, emerging band. Yeah. Right. Um, with an emerging, you know, green band leader, and I couldn't understand why they weren't as excited about it as me. And it, it, yeah. And now it's actually kind of fun to actually see think the about other side that. of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, it is great to see at any age what a good, I mean, playing, we, you and I say it, playing in a band is a team sport. And it's really fun. Any team is good. Any team, yes. where it's good people who are, you know, they're, 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 they're serious about what they do and being good at what they do. And they're, uh, generous in spirit in making the people around them better. I think that applies whatever level people are at. You that, know, that's I, the I, key. Yeah. I I remember, and it's certainly not universally true that, uh, but, that, that this shift has happened for me, but, but I certainly remember the first time that I realized, Oh wait, I'm not the greenest person here. Like, like I, I really like, actually being in a musical scenario where I'm the person that has the most to learn. Right. I, I, I yes, it's a challenge, but I, I think we've identified that I kind of like, you know, challenges and stretches and all that. Um, but I remember the first time where it was like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm in this particular scenario. I have something to teach. You know, it wasn't, it, and it wasn't like a, a truly binary thing. It was like other people have things that they could teach me too. But the first time that I actually brought something to the table, it was like, Oh, I, I actually have something like valuable from my experience doing this to share sure. with this person that doesn't have it. Right. Y- you know, and, and that was a, an interesting moment. It was kind of a sad moment because I was like, Oh crap. I like being the guy that knows the least, you know, <laughs> but, um, and so I, I, I continually try to seek it out where I play with people that are, that are better than me in a variety of ways. And it's, it's trust me, it's not hard to find people that are better than me. I might be the, might be the best drummer in the, in the room. Maybe, but it doesn't mean I'm the best musician in the room. In fact, often that's not even close to the case or nor am I the best singer or the best songwriter or, you know, whatever. Like there's always, there's things that everybody, hopefully in a band, everybody can teach everybody else something. And, and like you said, it makes the whole thing better. So, yeah. I like that. There were times in the house rockers where, you know, our bass player, Steve, he was, the great intermediary between what was technically right and what felt right. Right. So he had all the technical chops, all the theory chops, but he also, you know, got why the guys who didn't read weren't catching, you know, a certain timing or something like that. And he would, he would fix that often. And that was really good. But, and, and I'm, you know, super humbled, you know, my, my, my path having these professional musicians to learn from as we go along taught me so much about, uh, you know, what being a musician is, like I said, you know, it's amazing to me that these guys to a man, even though it's a hard way to make a living, I don't, none of them have ever expressed any remorse, regret, you know, looking over their shoulder, they were meant to be musicians and they're going to be musicians. Even if it means teaching all day and gigging sometimes for a hundred bucks at night or whatever it might be, you know, different points in time. Um, I, I just learned a lot. I learned a lot about music I learned a lot about musicians and I learned about a lot about life from this super interesting 
collection of dudes, right? Sure. You know, the, the guy who does all our arrangements, um, he was he was in the army for the army band for years and oh, years and years. He's kind of an that. army guy. Is that yeah. John Hassan or Hassan? Hassan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And he is a great an guy too, by the way. Like really good human. Great guy. Yeah. Yep. And you know, and the funny thing is he's like a you know a chill guy. But when we get asked to um play the national anthem, no messing around. He, you know, he has, of course, he yeah. has that background in his life. Yep. And, you know, he, that's the only time I think he will really bark at, you know, other guys. He's kind of the leader for that type of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Mike Mendoza, our, our tenor player, youngest of those guys, he actually started playing in bars when he was you know, 15 years old, I think, or, awesome. you know, right. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't legally allowed to be there, but he, you know, found what was meaningful to him in life and, uh, you know, figured out how to make a life. And now, you know, he's got, 60 students probably he's got a successful solo career and it's just a really i you know, i just admire the path that these guys have done to you know do what they like. i mean i like what i do i know you like what you do i mean and and you know it's not like everybody who has a day job hates their day job right sure, i don't sure. mean that in any way shape or form right but music is a hard choice right music is a you know not only is it financially a hard choice but it's a lot of rejection you know in a, in a very unique way it's just a hard a hard path, right? Absolutely. But I I have learned so much about life from these guys. Who it was, you know, there's just there's no question. That's who they are, and that's what they were going to do. So it's just it's been a great a great ride for me. That's cool. That's great. I yeah. um, I have some gear gab, Paul, to go through here. Uh, Bring it on. Yeah. We well, the first thing is we heard from listener Brian something that I I had no idea about. Um. Uh, I mention occasionally that I use the four score app, uh, which is an app. You could use it for a lot of things. I actually wind up using it for like uptown gigs because it has a great set list functionality that really works for me. And also I can take a PDF chart that I have in there and mark it up. I can also put not only tempo markings on it, but I can embed a click with it. Like it's, it's a great app. It's primary. It feels like it's primarily built for using uh, like theater scores and things like that. And it works really well for that. But I, I wind up using it for a lot of things. And Brian wrote in and said, um, in answering Bill's question a couple of weeks ago, Dave mentioned manually syncing the four score app. I use it all the time and stumbled upon the new auto sync function. It uses Apple's iCloud. Um, and you, you get to it by clicking the little menu that looks like a suitcase in the upper right. Click on sync. And then turn on sync with cloud. It'll ask you if you want to default to on or off. And that's it. And man, this was a game changer for me because I'm constantly taking, you know, I, I, I'll work with a score and four score, obviously. And, you know, I'll go to a rehearsal or whatever and make notes on it. And then it's like, oh, I got to sync that to my other iPad, it, you know, that I have as a backup or whatever. And now I don't have to do that anymore. So when Bill, when, sorry, when Brian shared this with us, I figured, well, I got to share it here too. So we all know about this. It's pretty amazing. Um, I don't know why it hasn't had that in the past. That's kind of the, that's the weird part is why, why is this, um, <laughs> why is this new? <laughs> but Hey, you know, that's how software's, uh, that's how software works. So, uh, so that was, that's, that's the first one in gear gab. The other one is, you know, I got that new Gretsch kit, Paul, and I've been using it gigging and I'll probably use it um, pretty regularly. It's a really kind of perfect kit for bitter pill sound wise. It looks great. It kind of fits the vibe, but um, it does not have what my Eames kit that I've been playing for 30 years has, which is I had a D112, an AKG D112 microphone built in to the bass drum of my Eames kit. Eames is, I guess they still are it's a different owner, but they're a custom drum shop. When I had the kit built, I sent him this, uh, I sent him this D one twelve that was from this company called may that used to make internal microphone kits for exactly this purpose. I don't think they're in business anymore, but, uh, it came with this mount or whatever. And because he was drilling the drums custom for me anyway, with all the hardware, he drilled this. So I have an XLR jack on the side of my kick drum. It's awesome. I, I get to a stage. I set up the drum. I plug an XLR in. I don't have to worry about a mic stand that some guitar player standing in front of me is going to kick over and move all night. You know, all that stuff. It's great. It's always in the right spot. It, it, sound engineers love it for the most part. You know, it's great. I don't have that in uh, the kit 
you know, I bought from Gretsch and I'm trying to think, okay, well, what am I going to do? And when I was at the theater doing the, the most, which where I brought my Eames kit, but was doing the most recent show when I did passing strange, there was another show happening in the, where the musicians were set up in the band pit. And I was talking to the sound engineer and he's like, yeah, I've been using this boundary mic, which is a condenser mic. You've probably seen them. They kind of look like a little flat, almost like a bean bag, mm. uh, you know? And yeah, yep. And he had been using a buyer dynamic one that came in like a kit of mics. And he's like, I love it. He's like, I just throw it in the drum on the pillow. And, uh, and it, it just sounds great. I'm like, okay, well, let me look into this. And that mic was like 200 bucks or something. I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. But let's just keep looking because, you know, we've over the years, we've been able to find things, especially microphones that, you know, especially these sort of purpose built mics where you can find things that are, you know, off brand or whatever, like that, the Behringer guitar mic, the guitar cab mic that's, you know, a quarter the price of the, the Sennheiser one that it, it's a clone mm -hmm. of, right? So I found that there is a, a Shure boundary mic that people really like. And then, of course, there is a Behringer and it is the BA-19A boundary mic and it's 79 bucks instead of 200 bucks. And I, I listened to some YouTube videos where people compared it with the, you know, the Shure one. And it was like, yep, yeah, they, they both sound good. They sound a little bit different. It's got a little mid scoop on it. I put it in my, uh, my kick drum here in the studio, which is my Mapex kick. And, you know, just put it in and into logic and just started recording and messed with it a little bit and compared it to my other, uh, mic that I have, you know, that like goes into the, like I have a mic on a stand or whatever, cause it's here in the studio and nobody kicks it. And it, I like the sound of this way better. It's got like a real, it picks up so much of the mid range. In fact, it, it picks up so much of the tone of the drum. I had to, I find I like it better with the mid scooped out of it, but for 79 bucks, uh, this boundary mic, it's a condenser mic. You know, you just give it phantom power and it's great. So it's the Behringer BA 19 a, and I'll link to this and, and the other stuff we mentioned here in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com. But, um, I'm, and you know, for 79 bucks, it's like throw it in the gig bag and good to go. Yeah. Yeah. They do make a, a mount, like an internal mount for it that you kind of, um, retrofit onto the drum. It screws into the screws on the inside of the lugs and it'll suspend the mic kind of in the middle of the drum. So you're not just throwing it on the, you know, on like the pillow or the pad or whatever you might have in the bottom of the drum, so, which I'll experiment with and, and share. But I was blown away. There's so much tone out of this thing. Like I, if I were to record with it, I probably would, would wind up having to EQ some out, but that's great. I'd much rather scoop a little here and there, you know? Well, kind of similar, like where we started this conversation about, about the bell curve of consumerization for in-ears. Yes. Because everybody's a podcast, there are so many microphones and the competition for microphone business is, you know, and speakers and in-ears, right? All of that stuff because it's in everybody's home and it's now an extension of pretty much everybody's computer or phone. Yeah. There are a lot of mics at good price points that are really, you know, compelling. The guitar cab mic that, that I mentioned is the Behringer B906. Uh, and that you can buy on Amazon for 45 bucks and, Crazy. and the, the Sennheiser e, e, E609 or whatever it is, yeah. is like 200 bucks. So, and, and, yeah. you know, I, like I've, I've AB'd the two cause I have both and they both sound good. There's a, they're a little bit different from each other, but they both sound good. And so if I need to buy two or three of these things to throw in my gig bag to have for guitar cabs, you know, for sound reinforcement at gigs, the difference between a $45 mic and a $200 mic is something no one's going to hear. Not even me. Right. And I'm listening on my yeah. in-ears, right? Like yeah. It, it, like, yeah. So we can complain a lot about Behringer and I'm sure some of it's deserved, but you know, these microphones, they, you know, I'll knock on wood because it's what I do, but I, I think I've had these B906s for four or five years now and use them at almost every gig. And I'm not careful with them. You know, I mean, they're, they're mics. Like I, I use them in a gig. It's it, stuff happens yep. and they dr fall and they drop and I don't, you know, I hand them to someone and I, th I know that they're going to do their best to not let it drop, but it also, it's going to drop. Like it's fine. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it is good. Um, where are we on time? Do we have time for more stuff? Our, our friend Dan East sent us 
a uh, a a note about all kinds of different things, but <laughs> one of them was is the um, Whirlwind PW1 Personal Wedge headphone amp. He says he hasn't gotten an opportunity to try it, but uh, but you know the specs look pretty good on it, and uh, and so I I figured I'd share that too. It's it, yeah, you should share that. And you should actually kind of cut and paste just that one section that Dan put the email. So, so Dan would be one of those guys that I was talking about before that are these musicians for life guys. That, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, there, Dan's not going to be anything other than a, a music. I mean, he's a sound engineer as well, but a life in the music world is, is what Dan was made for. We know Dan from our life in the, in the Apple world. Yep. Right. And um, uh, we get, you know, we've had him on the show twice, I think, two or three times, two times. At least three. I think maybe, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I and think the thing is, yeah. Dan keeps these conversations going and he sends us these long, thoughtful, you know, either commentary and stuff that we're talking about or stuff that he thinks we should just know about. And this would fall into that category. In so that that, I, which category. I would, yeah. yeah, I would just share that stuff because I think it'll be useful for people. Yeah, it's fascinating. This is, um, he is a big fan, of course, of using in ear monitors. Uh, and correctly, you know, he's aware that the headphone amps, that exist in a lot of the you know units that are out there are often the last piece of tech that a company spends some money on. And so what you wind up with is having to overdrive the signal just to get enough sound into your ears. And you know, these in-ear monitors, it was interesting when I was testing the all clairs, I went from using I, I, you know, I tested two of them that day, uh, that Saturday at the, at the gig, I tested the, the six driver version first and then the two driver version, uh, later for the evening show that day. And when I plugged in the two driver version, I had to take the gain knob, the, you know, the headphone volume knob on the little unit that, you know, powers my ears and lets me mix them in the theater there. I had to take it from probably 70% down to 40% which kind of makes sense when you think about it cuz in a six driver unit there's more drivers there's more crossovers the power's got to come from somewhere and so you're just that power's getting sort of soaked up in the system before it gets to deliver to your ears and of course when there were only two drivers in there it was like okay that's way too loud you know and so I brought it way down and and so you know along those lines Dan is a huge fan of a dedicated headphone amplifier for your in-ear monitors. And I've only ever used one before, but it does make a difference. However, I've used, you know, uh, speaker amplifiers, like discrete speaker amplifiers on my computers over the years, right? Like, you know, you, you have your speakers and you can just plug them into your computer because your computer's got a little amplifier or whatever, and that's fine, right? No, you plug into something with discrete power that is built to just send even just line level power out of it, it makes a huge difference. You get a wider sound field because you're not pushing the limits of the the device. You know, you've got tons of headroom and that gives you a cleaner sound or the opportunity for a cleaner sound. Of course, you could also drive your ears and make yourself deaf, but please don't do that. Uh, but yeah, and, and so, the and you know, Whirlwind has a good rep. And so he, he sent us this note about the PW1, but there's a lot of them out there. Uh, so if you know of one that you really like, let us know. Feedback yep. at giggabpodcast.com. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the last one that I, well, I guess I got I got two others. The, the, the quick one is that Logic, Apple released Logic Pro 10.8 earlier this week, yesterday, I guess. And it now has a whole mastering assistant in there. I started playing with it and it really is. It's like, it'll listen to your mixes and it's got some presets but it's really meant to to be like that, uh, you know, AI. They don't use the term AI. Of course, Apple doesn't use that term. But but it you know it fits into today's world usage of Machine AI. Learning. It, what's that? Machine learning. Machine learning. Right. It's it's all these pattern recognition things, and and so you know it will do a lot of that work for you if you're putting mixes together in Logic. A adding the mastering assistant now, it's free. You know, Apple, I don't think they've charged for an upgrade for Logic in uh, how many years? Like, it's crazy. Uh, but it's free. Just do the update, and then you're good to go. And uh, and you can just add it in. 
I, I will say don't add it in during your live monitoring recordings because it adds mm, about 500 milliseconds of latency. And, and that's not an, that that's a, a my guess as a number, but I turned it on for our podcast setup here and it was like, yep, nope, not using that. Like I can't hear my voice a half a second later. So, but you know, for a, a mixing environment, it doesn't matter if you're adding latency. It doesn't, you know, that's kind of how that works. So check that out. And then, uh, Stage Ninja. Have you used the Stage Ninja stuff over the years, Paul? Do you know what I'm talking about? With the uh, I, I, are they a snake or are they the um, the um, the the um, iPod and iPad holder things? It's the latter. It's the clamps yeah, yeah. with the with the the sort of goosenecky style. I, you've talked about them before, though. I have, and they just came out with some new clamps. They've got their uh, Phone Pro and heavy duty phone mount, which uh, really kind of it, it, the clamp now opens up to two inches. So you've got a much, you know, many more options as to where you can put it, which is something I've found at gigs or whatever. It's like, you know, somewhere, sometimes you just want to clamp it on somewhere. And this is good if you're using your phone or iPad to, you know, hold charts or whatever, or mix your in-ears. But it's also good if you want to put your phone somewhere to record the gig, it, you know, mm. having, having these things. And with the, with the big jaw now on those, uh, on those mounts, it, it makes a difference. So uh, I wanted to share that too. And if you haven't used the stage Ninja, Ninja stuff, check it out. Like I still use a mount, a clamp that I got for my iPad probably 10 years ago. I think I had it before we started doing the show and it lives in my gig bag and I beat the crap out of it. And I even knocked one of the little like, like feet off of it so that it only has like one foot on one end to hold my iPad <laughs> and it's still totally fine at every gig. Like, it's like, I just noticed it once. I'm like, Oh, well, I guess I'm using it cause I have no other option and it's totally mm-hmm. fine. Uh, so yeah, they, this stuff is built to last for clearly like 10 years old. It doesn't owe me anything and it, um, and I'm still going to use it. So yeah. Nice. Yeah. I like the gear gap. Send your gear gap in feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You got anything else for us today, Paul? I think we'll do it for today. All right, man. This was fun. It was fun. I missed your voice. It was nice. Uh, you know, I heard your voice in my head while I was doing the interview with, <laughs> with Andy, but you know, what was I saying? Uh, wrap it up, move it along, ask this question, <laughs> do this. <laughs> it was great. No, I, I appreciate sounds right. it. Yeah, it sounds right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if, if only people that we've interviewed, could see the text trail oh God, that goes no. back and forth. Oh God, no, 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 no. no. Are, <laughs> this is to the grave, my friend. That's right. Yep. <laughs> uh, thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sending in your cool stuff, your gear gab, rather. Your uh, cool stuff found my other show. Your questions, your comments. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Check out factormeals.com slash giggab50. Paul, what's the thing that we say? Always be performing.